right, my name's Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. Before we begin, I want to let you know or encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. You can also see all of the uh, in-store events if you're in the Portland area. Lots of great events coming up there uh, here as well. If you don't already do so, you can also follow us on the social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're excited to welcome Jason McBride and Lydia Yuknovich. In his book, Eat Your Mind, The Radical Life and Work of Kathy Acker, Jason McBride tackled the immense task of writing about the life of the celebrated and influential experimental writer, Kathy Acker, who lived from 1947 to 1997. 25 years after her death, she remains one of the most original, shocking, and controversial artists of her era. The, art, the author of novels such as Blood and Guts in High School, Empire of the Senseless, and Pussy King of Pirates, Acker wrote obsessively about the treachery of love, the limitations of language, and the possibility of revolution. She was notorious for her methods, collaging together texts stolen from other writers with her own diaries, sexual fantasies, and political critiques, as well as her appearance. Her punkish hairstyles, tattoos, and outfits made her look like no other writer. Her work was exceptionally prescient, taking up complicated conversations about gender, sex, capitalism, and colonialism that continue today. Ten years in the works, Each Your Mind draws on exclusive interviews with hundreds of Acker's intimates, as well as her private journals, correspondences, and early drafts of her work. It's a thrilling and long overdue reassessment of a misunderstood genius. McBride is joined in conversation tonight by Portland author Lydia Yuknovich, author of the novel Thrust, as well as other bestsellers such as The Book of Joan and the memoir The Chronology of Water. We thank her for being part of tonight's event. This event also includes an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. Perhaps most importantly, please support Jason and Powell's by purchasing copies of Eat Your Mind from us. Links to buy that book and Lydia's books will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Jason, Lydia, we're so excited to welcome you tonight. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much for having me. Love you, Kevin. Love you, Powells. Jason, I'm telling everyone now what I told you privately, which is I love your book. It's the first material on Kathy that uh, made me like fist pump and fuck yeah while I was reading it. I was very excited. So the first thing I want to say is I just want to express gratitude to you for writing it for me personally, clearly. That is very, very kind of you, and, and 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 it means the world to me. Thank you so much, Lydia. Like I said, I'm, I'm a huge fan of yours, and I know that you knew Kathy uh, well. And um, I, I regret that we never actually that I never actually interviewed you when I was when I was doing my interviews. And and but you had written so eloquently about her that I felt that I didn't necessarily need to. But, but yeah, all I, I you know I probably did not know her well, but I've spent my life writing love letters to her with my own work. So that's that's what I get for, you know, my brief lightning bolt moment with this amazing person. So the first thing I want to ask before you ask a question, I just want to say um, for people who may not know that today, in fact, is a very auspicious day. It's the 25th anniversary of Kathy's death. And, yes. uh, you know, I think anybody who's watching this, I mean, if you want to raise a glass or light a candle. In, in I do. Moment, do. Yeah. Yes. Here's to Kathy. Yeah. Well, it's the question I want to open with is because, you know, for readers who do know her work or don't know her work, why the hell, Jason, <laughs> yeah. like, what drew you to her, her work and, and this book that took some effort? <laughs> it did take some effort. Um, Kathy was the first, uh, you know, surprisingly enough, the first professional writer I saw read uh, in public when I was in my second year of college and in Toronto, where I live, um, I saw her uh, with my dear friend Derek McCormick. We saw her at a literary festival, and and, and she read 
and um, I had been a, uh, a Burroughs fan, William Burroughs fan in high school. And so I, I, I you know, had read Virginia Woolf. I had read, read Faulkner. I had read the modernists in, in high school. And so I was, I was already primed a bit for what she was doing. Mm -hmm. um, but seeing her on stage and seeing, uh, it, was, it was shocking. Like I had never seen a writer that looked like that. I had never seen a writer uh, write like that. I had never seen a writer perform like that. And so it was it was mind blowing and, and life changing. And, and I honestly became obsessed with her for, for several years after that. And, and you know, I read all of her, all the work of hers that, that I could find. I read, you know, all the writers that she talked about, all the writers that were part of her circle. And so I, so she became like I was in school, but she became a whole other kind of education for me. And, um, and so I, so she was very influential on me at that young age. And then, uh, you know, years passed and, and I expected a biography of her to naturally emerge because she had led this extremely colorful life and, you know, her work I felt was so significant that, you know, inevitably a book about her life would come out and, and it never happened. And so I, after waiting for years, and hearing, you know, rumors about books in the works that never materialized, I finally contacted her executor and said, you know, I had become in 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 those intervening years, I had become a journalist and had met people who were part of her circle. Yeah. And, and felt that, you know, I didn't think I was necessarily the right person, but I asked if I could do it. And Matthias Visioner, who is Kathy's executor, um, was extremely encouraging and, and enthusiastic and, and said yes and and you know put me in touch with with many many of the people that I interviewed for the book and and you know supported me throughout the full uh, nearly 10 years that I that I worked on it yeah 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 um I was just trying to think and for you guys out there what if Kathy Acker had been the first literary reading I'd ever gone to <laughs> I would I would um I would be even worse off than I already am in terms of like just <laughs> going down a road nobody wants you to go down yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. amazing that was your first reading yeah I mean yeah. you I'm so glad that happened to you yeah so am I I mean I saw her after that I saw her read three or four more times I saw her read with William Rose they read in, in Toronto uh, ah! a year or two later and and so yeah I got an opportunity to see her many you know a number of times yeah that's beautiful that's beautiful well let's let's dip down into her work and and the things you have noticed, um, one of the things you say early on, it might even be in the preface part, the beginning part is that um, literature was her life and her adversary. Hmm. And, and so everybody pause for a second, because that's huge, or it's huge to me anyway. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit what you mean by that. Well, her life I, and her adversary. I think that literature, I mean, Kathy was like, absolutely thoroughly uh devoted to books and to reading and and to literature and i think that you know her her use of other books which you know kevin mentioned briefly in the introduction you know is so it's you know the most famous thing about her books is her use of other people's writing um you know call it plagiarism call it you know theft call it you know piratical plunder whatever you want to call it um her use of of literature i mean literature was her life. I mean, it really was in, in, in many ways. But at the same time, I mean, literature was liberating for her, but also could be oppressive because she saw in a lot of literature, especially the books that she had grown up reading and, and, and you know, essentially revering, um, she began as she, you know, dug into those books more uh, thoroughly and comprehensively, she could see the kind of political structures that those books might have represented and the oppressive structures that those books might have represented to her as a woman, um, as a, a young person. Um, and so began, so those books, while still uh, offering her certain kinds of refuges, uh, also she could see how they could oppress her and oppress yeah. other, other people as well. And so I think that by taking them apart and reconfiguring them as she did, um, it was a way to kind of reclaim those books and turn them into something that were, was useful to her. And yeah, I, I love that. Yeah. I love that. I mean, let's just go straight to that idea because it just ruffles so many people's feathers. Uh, <laughs> you know, the second you say the word plagiarism mm. um, and then you move to the word collage. Yeah, yeah. And then when I was coming up through grad 
school, the term postmodern piracy was being bandied yeah. about. Uh, but they're all forms of, you know, you know, taking on material that was not hers, inhabiting it mm. and rerouting it or doing something else with it. But we're in such a tricky time right now in terms of, you know, those those moves, those yeah. narratives. Oh, no, it's true. It is. And, and I just want to add one more thing is that, that I think that Kathy, because she did write so relentlessly about her own life um, and, you know, she would uh, bristle at the notion that she was an autobiographical writer. But yeah. she, she clearly is. And I think we can get into that if we want uh, later. But I think the fact that she was drawing so much from her own life and her, so much of her life was reading and was books. And so she was using those books as material in the same way that she was using her own you know, family history as material, her own relationships with men as material, like, like reading yeah. another form of material that, that made up her life. Yeah, I would say, and I think you'd agree with this because I saw versions of this in your telling um, that she was closer to books than she was to people. Ah, she, yeah, think, yeah. You know, in relationship with literature, mm. uh, psychologically, sexually, emotionally, mm. um, the way other people talk about, about having marriages or lovers or, yeah. you know, relationships. And, yeah. and I was wondering, like, um, I got the impression from your story of her story or her body and writing that when she used plagiarism and collage, for example, like we're talking about, she was using it in the service of um, activism or agitation or critique mm -hmm. of things like capitalism and patriarchy. And mm -hmm. to do that, she had to include what is the story from my actual body? Yeah. And that's where it goes into her life, but it's not autobiographical the way other people's writing right, is. Yeah, would you agree with that? I would agree with that. Yeah. Like, I think she's doing something like almost completely unique, I think, in, in, yeah. in literature. Like, I think that there's no, like, people have asked me many times, like, who is doing what Kathy Acker did now? And there, there isn't really anybody that's doing exactly what Kathy was doing in, in, in a variety of ways. And um, I mean, she has lots of inheritors and people who, you know, uh, have taken things from her but I think to do exactly what she was doing like she seems to me still still singular yeah I totally agree with that I absolutely agree with that <laughs> I mouth off about that all the time too <laughs> um a few different ways you have described the activity of reading her novels I yeah. I just um took delight in how you got playful with your descriptions. You said, it's like you've emerged from a car crash, or it's like you've emerged from emergency surgery, or it's like you've emerged from an acid bath. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can, you, can you speak a little bit to your own reading experience? I mean, those seem apt to me, but like, what's it like to be you in her <laughs> material? Well, it's different because, you know, I read the books when I was young, and then I re reread the books when I was writing this book and reread them, you know, multiple times. And, and, you know, I was obviously reading them now through a biographical lens and, and you know, trying to find clues about her life in her work. Um, and so the reading experience was quite different. Um, you know, when I first came to those books, like, you know, those books, you know, they were thrilling, but they were also frightening and they were, you know, sexy and they were upsetting and, 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 and all those things. Um, and then when I was rereading them again, like that, those ideas about it being like, a, you know, going through an acid bath or like the, the, the I, I was shocked. And I think maybe it's maybe a little bit of a function of my age now versus when I was younger and had maybe more of an appetite for stuff that was like harmful yeah. to me in yeah. a way, you know what I mean? And, and that, that now reading them, it's, it's, uh, more like I found them just harder to take in a way because it's, it, it, they're, they're, they're still like all, all the value that I found in them when I was young is still there, but mm -hmm. the, they're, they're, they're just, um, they're so relentlessly alienating and unafraid to alienate the reader. And, and for a reader, you know, like, like I, when I was reading Kathy, when I was young, like, I was like, I can only read experimental fiction. That's all I can read. And, and now I read much more widely, I would say. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was just so, so I was more conscious maybe when I was writing the book that how difficult the books can be for the average reader. Yeah, I hear that. I have a funny, tiny story. When uh, I was um, first getting off on her books, you know, I was younger too. I was in grad school when I first encountered them. And I, <laughs> in one of my grad school classes, I gave a presentation on her 
And during the presentation, I would read excerpts from yeah. Empire of the Senseless in particular. And three women in the graduate class were just seeing their crying. Oh, really? um, you know, they felt entirely uh, transgressed and harmed just yeah. from me reading the excerpts. One of them like left the room. And at the age I was at where I was <laughs> into the value of agitation and resistance, I was like, score, winning. <laughs> you know, now I, I, at this other age, as you're saying, I have a, I would just say deeper, more complex understanding of the dynamics. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, the fact remains that on the page, something happens to you mm. when you read her books. I mean, oh, it's, it's not a distant, passive reading experience. It's like somebody's shaking you or scratching you or... Um, it's very visceral, very physical and tangible and really... Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's true, yeah. But I mean, it begs the question, and you you kind of hinted at this a second ago. Do you think if she was, you know, starting out today, mm. um, you know what times we're living in? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I don't know. Like, you think you mean, would she be able to write like she wrote? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Honestly, like it's a it's a hard question to answer. Like I think not in some ways. Um, but a question, a related question that. Um, is often posed is like, who is the Kathy Acker now? Who's doing what Kathy does now? Um, and again, like we said, you know, there's not really anybody doing exactly what she's doing, but there are artists like um, last night, uh, an event here, Mackenzie Wark uh, suggested that Juliana Huxtable, the artist, is somebody who's, who's comparable to Kathy now. Um, but, but I think the idea of being transgressive now is much different. And I think the culture has shifted in so many ways. And it's like, like when Kathy was doing uh her thing i think that there was a the culture this is a kind of a i think maybe just a little simplistic but but the culture was more monolithic right there was kind of a larger bigger culture that everyone kind of participated in and that she could kind of rail against whereas now the culture is so diffu diffuse diffuse um and splintered and fractured and, and, and there's not quite the same it's not as easy to kind of figure out how to fight that like i mean i see what you're saying i see what you're saying yeah, i mean i was um, thinking a lot when I was reading your book about how she was kind of tied to her times. And I mean that both um, literally and figuratively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you named some of the things going on in her times, like conceptual art, experimental music, poetry wars, the mainstreaming of, I would say, BDSM and porn, biker chicks, cyberpunks. Like there was a stew also yeah. of that moment, that yeah. historical moment that she emerged from. And in some ways, um, maybe she was an articulation moment. She was like, you know, she popped up through yeah. that stew and, and made an expression or an articulation. Yeah. Moment. That just doesn't happen very often. No, it's true. Yeah, you're right. And, and it's interesting to me. I, did, I To me, I didn't really realize this until I was working on the book that, that her kind of zealot like uh, presence in so many different cultural moments and movements that she, she did kind of, you, know, you can see the sort of history of avant-garde uh, America through her very clearly in so many different ways, like at least the last half of the 20th century, like she was there for almost everything, right? It's, yeah. it's really kind of shocking that, uh, and that she was, I think. Yeah, you said the phrase, I was going to ask you about that. It's a similar question to could, could she have emerged now? Um, and maybe this question is stupid, so you can just bat it away if you want to. But I've been wondering if even the term avant-garde kind of died with her generation of artists, like yeah, yeah, as as a concept, as a notion, as a space. I, I'm not sure. I don't That's know either. I mean, I don't think it's a stupid question, but I don't know if I have an answer for it. Really, I don't either. Yeah. I just you see what I mean. Though? Yeah, no, I, I know it's you know, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's a thorny question. I have to go think about that, but um, we're going to re reconnect yeah. and decide what we think about that. <laughs> um, there's a, you mentioned this more than once, uh, her narrators are often, you call them child women. Mm, did I? Yeah. You did, more than once. Okay. Um, and it's true. They often yeah. are. They're like coming of age, age, mm -hmm. girl yeah. things. Yeah. <laughs> Or some, girls. Of them, I guess, some of them are a little older, some of them are teens. Early yeah. Pre -teens. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts you could share with them? I read your book. 
Yeah. I don't know if they've all read your book, but you have any shot, thoughts you could share with them about the space of that age and body? Um, um, hmm, that's a that's a that's a hard question. I, I, I yeah, I think there's a few. I have a few thoughts around that. I mean, I think that uh, I haven't thought about it so recently, so I'm I'm struggling a little bit. But the uh, I think the idea that Kathy like you know so much of her work is about uh obviously about uh, identity and, and and the mercurial qualities of identity and and, and shape shifting and and becoming yeah. it's always about it's always about becoming and, yeah. and I mean to write about an age where that's so you know significant um in everybody's life life um I think that that she was drawn to that moment of becoming uh you know becoming an adult becoming sexual becoming uh i'm um, not omniscient becoming uh more clearly sentient eh, that's not the right word either but she you know she those those that that really kind of transformative moment of adolescence i think was extremely important to her and i mean it was very important to her in her own personal life but also in terms of of her intellectual life and, and yeah. I think, you know i mean becoming sexual for her was a a, a major i mean it is for most people but it was a like a, a major almost cataclysmic event i think agreed agreed i mean also for that age human <laughs> yeah. and it is it is the time in which we as human animals undergo significant adaptation <laughs> yeah 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 um and so that spit narrative space is super interesting to me i love your answer i think you're right about that and what you're saying um I I keep thinking back to readers. I wish we could take a poll and see of the people yeah. here who has already read her and who hasn't. You can identify yourselves if you want to. Um, but what do you think? What do you think readers get wrong about her? Or if that's too weird, what do you think makes them shy to approach her texts? Well, I think it's like being, I think that there's, they're so unlike most other novels. Um, I think people start to read them and they're like, what the fuck? Like, it's like, it's really, it's, it's what really, I love about them though. Yeah, no, I love it, but I love it too. But I think that it's so unfamiliar to a lot of people and more so now where, where, where this kind of writing, like it did have a moment, right? There were writers like, uh, Dennis Cooper, um, and, uh, Gosh, I'm blanking, but there's a generation of writers who were doing who were, who who were quite well known. Um, you know, they weren't mainstream by any means, but they were writing work that was considered transgressive, right? I mean, even some yes. like Freddie Fred Sinalis, right? Like there was there there was a moment in in the in American literary culture where that was kind of the thing. It was in vogue, um, and uh, I think um, that's not really here now. We don't really have that. Uh, I don't think. Um, and uh, so when you, if you pick up a Kathy Acker novel, and I hope you know people will after reading this book, a lot more people will, um, that they, uh, it still will be shocking to people, right? I think, I mean, you know, she, but I think what the answer to your earlier question, what, what do people get wrong is I think people often forget how funny she can be, like, oh, she's like very, very, very funny. And, 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 and the humor kind of erupts in, in surprising places, you know, the juxtapositions are often kind of comical. Um, but she has hilarious lines in, in you know, all of her books and, and, and passages that are quite uh, amusing and, and just brash and, and strange and, and yeah. I so agree with that. Uh, you mentioned that, well, several people have mentioned that David Foster Wallace called her artistically pretty crummy and actually no fun to read at all, which made me spit wine upon <laughs> his book. Just... <laughs> on yeah. purpose because yeah. I was so angry at that misinterpretation bless yeah. him anyway yeah. um now that he's gone to dirt but that's totally wrong and then I was thinking about that why were they so funny to me in certain spots and yeah. and I here's what I came up with that so when I first encountered her books I was coming out of trauma I was coming out of an abusive father um sexual trauma from from particularly men in my years of growing up in my teens and 20s a society that kind of made women feel like second class citizens still true <laughs> um and i encountered her books and she was using the story of what happened 
happens to girls and women as an allegory for a political activist mm -hmm. you know story about this is what capitalism does to all of us this is yeah. what patriarchy does to all of us and so when i got to the parts that were super dark they <laughs> reflected my experience of trauma as a girl and a woman and so lots of it's hilarious to me it's just <laughs> a little bit dark in yeah. the humor corner <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. that yeah. i really appreciated yeah. that and it's what made me laugh out loud like it's okay to laugh mm -hmm. um at these as you said juxtapositions and storylines where you know other people's ideas of what's terrible to write about could also have pockets of beauty mm -hmm. pockets of humor and pockets of tenderness and yeah. No, for sure. And you reminded me of something. So a relative of mine, I, I won't uh, give too many identifying details in case she doesn't want to people okay. to know this, but she, uh, you know, a young woman who uh, has had mental health struggles and and has uh, had, has recently read Kathy Acker for the first time. And she was starting with Blood and Guts in high school, which is not the book I would necessarily recommend that everybody start with, but, but she wanted to read it. And so she read it and she was worried that it would trigger certain you know, emotions and, and, and the traumas that are in represented in the book might be uh, too difficult for her. But by the time she finished it, she said she found it empowering and yeah. um, and really enjoyable. And uh, and then she went on to read Great Expectations. And, and so she so, yeah, I think the the kind of perhaps naive idea that because Kathy writes about trauma as much as she does, that that for a person who has grappled with trauma in their own life, that those books would then be, you know, too difficult is not necessarily true. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I'm sure there are some humans for whom that would not be a good narrative space to be in. And I completely respect that idea. But for me, I felt the opposite. I felt seen, I felt heard, I felt named. Um, and I felt empowered because yeah. somebody was telling the story, not of the victim, but of the pirate. Right, yeah, yeah. Or the half robot girl who survives, you know, um, and these were profoundly important figures of narrative that didn't slump into the victim spot where all you can do is survive and go woot. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, that whole idea of the pirate, I was going to ask you that too. It tracks in more than one of her books, this yeah, notion yeah. of the pirate and the figure of... Um, the criminal yeah yeah how think, important or not important do you find that criminal I mean, I think it's really important really important to kathy i mean it's no coincidence that i mean from the like it's funny that she has i mean criminal criminality throughout you know is a motif throughout her books most of her books oh. um, and i think that she all saw herself as an artist as being a criminal you know you're a misfit you're an outcast you're on the the margins as an artist um and you know it was you know it's a romantic idea of criminality I and mean, I, I mentioned in the book like when she worked in uh sex show in in times square in the 70s you know she you know got you know she was busted once went to jail and then was uh went to court and um you know she could see that the guys that own the sex club or sorry the 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 club uh that they were in cahoots with the cops to a certain degree and that there was kind of like there these were real criminals like that there were like and they, well, they weren't sexy and they weren't romantic and they weren't and they were just kind of like thuggish businessmen basically yeah so yeah. like so i think her idea of a criminal in her books is somebody who's much more romantic and 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 is like something that uh, uh is somebody to be not necessarily venerated but you know at least she regarded them highly Right. Like oh, I so agree. I mean, they're like sexy fugitives. Yeah. Like you want to be around them. You want if somebody mm -hmm. came by and said, get in the car, you'd get in the car. <laughs> or you want to be them yourself, right? You want to be the pirate. Totally. Like she, you know, yeah, she wants to be the girl pirate. Yeah. Totally. Um, do you do you have a favorite part of her life that, you know, as you were researching mm -hmm. and finding stuff out, do you is there a part you found out that like, oh, that's that got me that's, that's a good that's a good question i i uh i think there are a few parts i think that the part that probably i mean i knew the least i mean it's funny when i started the book um i knew so little like i knew what i knew about kathy was kind of like 
you know, when when I was discovering Kathy, like the internet obviously didn't exist. And, and so I would read every single interview I could get my hands on. And, the, and there, you know, she did a number of interviews, but it wasn't easy to find that stuff all the time, um, like it is now. And, and so I had kind of gleaned lots of little crumbs about her life. Um, but then when I actually started researching the book, like I didn't even know that her and Sylvia Lautranger had been lovers until I started talking to people. And, and now it's like, that's, you know, duh, like everybody knows that. But, but <laughs> being a, um, so, so the part that I guess that I now maybe feel the most, that I enjoyed the most perhaps was her years uh, when she taught at the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, ah, yeah. She had... Like I knew, I knew she had done that. I knew she was part of that world and I knew people who knew her then. Um, but it was just so nice to see her actually, um, you know, have some joy at that point. Like she had, you know, she had a little bit more financial stability. She really, really enjoyed her students and she had a really strong community um, of, of writers that, you know, she still fought with them, but she also, you know, she had her motorcycle crew and she had, you know, her tattooists. Like she, she had a lot of people that and and then she was starting to develop her really profound relationships with um her psychic and her astrologer and you know like like people who um so she had like she just seemed like she was enjoying life to a certain degree that and it just felt i mean maybe just writing that part was like i could feel a little bit of her happiness which yeah that was kind of a, like a zenith there, right yeah yeah i know what you mean it's like she was pulsing yeah, yeah. Around those years, with everything she was gonna be ever. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good point. Do you have? <laughs> this is so mean. Do you have a favorite <laughs> book of hers? I'll tell yeah. you mine. Sure, you tell me yours. Yeah. Empire of the Senseless. Okay, I I used to say everyone Empire else's of... least favorite. <laughs> I know that's, that's true. I used to say Empire of the Senseless too because it was the first one I read. Um, but then doing writing the book, I think Great Expectations became my favorite, uh, only because it's it has a there's a sweetness to it, but also a real profound sadness to it. Um, there's a lot of humor in it. It's one of her shorter books. Um, but I uh, and also a very close second probably is In Memoriam to Identity, which I oh that one's in my heart too for sure. And my mother, do you, uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to like. Now yeah. they're all conflating as my yeah, favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, but I remember feeling struck by lightning with yeah. her. Um, but that makes sense to me. <laughs> I love you, Derek yeah. McCormack, McCormack. Sorry, I said it wrong the first time. I love you for saying that. Um, and this is a good time to remind you guys: put some questions in the Q and A, or I'll just hog it. <laughs> <laughs> There's some stuff in the love... chat. Is, is, are, the, are the questions in the Q&A or are they in the chat? Are they... They're supposed to be in the Q&A, but I'm looking at both of them just in case. Um, but put some put some questions in there, humans. We want to know questions. what you're wondering. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny when people ask what your favorite is, I find that people, it's almost always like what the very first Kathy Acker book they read. Like That's the one that are like, oh, that got them hooked and that remains their favorite. Well, that makes some yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jack Skelly wants to know, with Kathy having impacted you so deeply, did she also impact your writing, verse or fiction or other artistic pursuits aside from journalism? That's a great question. That's a question, that's a question for me or for you or both of us? You, for you. Oh, they're all for you, baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know that she, I think her, <sighs> hmm. Not on an obvious level, um, I think, but I think her, because I mean, I write like this book is, you know, pretty conventionally written, I'd say. Like, it's not like I, I, I really wanted to write a book that was like other people have written books where I think they try to uh, kind of uh, infuse a bit of Kathy's either technique or spirit into the writing to kind of like that they try to bring it closer to her work. But I really wanted to write something that. Uh, would make her books appealing and her life appealing and interesting to people who may not know her work. Um, so I, I I try to make it as, as transparent and as accessible as, as I could while still kind of you know trying to maintain or preserve the the, the complexity and the difficulty of the work um, if that makes sense. But in terms of my right my writing, I don't think so, Jack. I don't think that it really has uh, I think maybe very, very like deep down. 
Um, but I'm going to think about that a bit more, so I have a better answer for you next time. I, I bet there's a virus in you that, yeah. sorry to use the burrows, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that something got in you, some seed. Yeah, no, and stuff. No, I mean, yeah. Um, Anonymous wants to know. Anonymous, okay. What is in your book that we've never seen in any other book, facts or people or documents or tidbits? Uh, there are a number of people, um, I think, that haven't, uh, I mean, there are people like, um, uh, there's a figure in the book named Simon Usher, a playwright, uh, English playwright who had a relationship with Kathy, um, a romantic relationship that was uh, extremely important to her um, for a few months, a year or so, um, and uh, was a huge influence on Don Quixote, and which I had no clue of. Um, and I've never seen anybody talk about him or her in connection with each other. Um, so he was one figure. Um, uh, Richard Foreman, David Sally spoke at length, uh, speak at length in the book about um, the opera that they collaborated with Kathy on. Um, that is, that is, I believe, new. Um, there's lots of new stuff threaded throughout. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean. I should, of course, acknowledge that, you know, we all know that Chris Krauss uh, published a biography of Kathy, um, which I think, you know, credit where credit's due, like Chris, you know, was very generous with me. Uh, she shared sources and, and, and things with me. You're, you're making a face. But the, um, uh, but I think I'm Chris's book not to say anything. Chris did not write about every part. I tried to write about every moment, significant creative moment in Kathy's life. And, and, and Chris, you know, she didn't so that that's correct yeah. <laughs> i'm trying to be good and not say anything about any other books just how much i love your book uh, it's i don't know if this um resonates for you but another thing that happened to me when i was reading it that i was so filled with relief about is that you write about her life and work kind of in awe uh, the opposite of celebrity or the opposite of celebritizing. Sorry, which, I, in, my, in my characterization of her is? Yeah, um, yeah, and celebrity culture is the is a bane of my existence. I think we've created something so monstrous, I almost can't make sentences about it. But uh, you managed to not, you know, write about her in, an, in a way that, you know, catapulted her above us into this celebrity zone. And she would have, I mean, she liked attention for sure. Yeah. And she liked yeah. culture and she liked fashion and she liked, you know, other famous folk and so forth. But um, celebrity was not a space she wanted to stand in. Um, I really appreciated that about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I yeah, I, I don't know how I would write about her as a celebrity. I mean, I, yeah, we, I do write about it as it's happening to her, like people trying to turn her into a celebrity. And I think she yeah, was but... kind of a strange kind of celebrity for a little moment. Um, but uh, yeah, it was extremely complicated for her. Yeah, I think um, one thing, and this was true up until her death um, with, with tattoos and scars that connected to her, her cancer experience, there was, you know, she so wrote from the inside out mm -hmm. and writing and her body were not separate. No, yeah, no, for sure, yeah. <laughs> Which you also write very eloquently about. You guys need to, yeah, you write about that in more than one way, I think, and it's very eloquent. Um, possibly Kevin wants to know, He'd love to know about Kathy's earliest writing and publishing experiences. Um, <laughs> where to begin? There's a lot. There's a lot about it. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I go into a lot of detail about those early days and 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 a lot about her notebooks and, and the notebooks that she wrote in her early twenties and the poetry that she wrote in her late teens and early early twenties and how that all fed that work. So there's a lot. Yeah, I don't. I I wouldn't even know how to answer that question because it's uh, there's probably hundreds of well 100 pages in there about those it's worth um tracking down you guys it's so cool to read jason's um kind of tracking how she got to you know i am a writer and what that means for her because 
you know, there's almost like an old school garage band mentality. Like I'm just going to do this on a street corner on these pieces of paper and sex work and performance art kind of, I think you'd agree, wove in there. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Like I'm inhabiting writing. Yeah. I'm, I, you know, it's my body. And then later, 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 all that material began to uh, morph into books, bookness. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> no, her whole first, I mean, uh, Derek McCormick, who, who, who asked a question or, or made a comment earlier, like he, he, he said to me that um, he was surprised that how long it took Kathy to get published, like that she spent a long time, you know, doing it herself, you know, it was all very DIY, it was really handmade books, it was self-distribution, yeah. I mean, and it, and it was very much of the time, I mean, mail art was very, uh, you know, had a moment at that time, and um, and then punk, of course, came along, and so, like, so all the things that she was doing were very much in the zeitgeist as well, and so I think, um, yeah. Only she was doing them first and she was doing them better. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But then it became um, professionalized, like her work, her work or her, her literary life became professionalized, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. True story. Um, in your research, did you find any unpublished work? Is there anything of hers you secretly know is yet to come somehow, some kind of trove? I mean, there's all of her journals. Like, I mean, her journals are fascinating, but the sat the sad part i mean they, they, that's not true they have been published there's a there's a, a book that i use as a very valuable resource resource uh, uh french publication and i can't remember the exact title right now i'm afraid but uh, wait, wait, hold on i will tell you the exact title which is um uh and it it cataloged um it was you know really really um uh valuable, invaluable resource uh, for me and for anyone who's writing about Kathy's early days now. Um, uh, it's Kathy Acker, 1971 to 1975, edited by Claire Finch and Justin Zagajou. Um, and, uh, and so they took all the notebooks, uh, or most of them, and a lot of the early poems from her archive at NYU and, and made a beautiful book out of those. Uh, so, but I think her, yeah, I think if you were to publish a uh, anything else? I mean, there, there's a little bit, there's lots of poetry that's never really been published. Uh, um, some of it's not, you know, gonna knock your socks off, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it's all Kathy Acker. And, um, but yeah, if there's anything, I don't think there's anything really long and sustained that hasn't been published that I'm aware of. I wish there was a, a box somewhere of just her drawings. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would make me personally giddy. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of letters too. I mean, maybe her letters would be of interest too, but they're kind of all over the place too. And, and I know, I know that there are letters out there that I didn't actually get to or I never found, um, which is the story, I guess, of any biography. But, yeah. um, there's a. Uh, can you remind this person asking a question? What writing Kevin Killian gave to you? Had he started a biography on Kathy? Kevin Killian started a biography. Um, I don't believe so. He wrote a biographical essay that uh, called Ghost Parade that Kathy appears in, but I don't think he had, I think he maybe had, somebody had, I think after, I remember after he published his Jack Spicer book, somebody said to him, you should write a biography of Kathy Acker. And he said, no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Um, and but Kevin did give me, uh, it didn't get, it, it was going to be a, a long, very long footnote in the book. Um, Kathy published, uh, won a couple of poetry contests early on, grade six, if I remember. Um, and I, I include those poems in the book. Um, and I sent them to Kevin uh, just to get his, his take on them. And he wrote me a really hilarious and, and brilliant uh, take on one of them. Um, no, actually on two and, and comparing Kathy to Stevie Nicks in some Kevinish way. <laughs> That's awesome. I should probably put that on my website just so people can see it. You should, you should. Um, can you, if, do we have time? Yeah, we have a little more time. Would you mind speaking a little bit about uh, what it was like working with Matthias, her executor, who is a dear friend of mine and I love him. So there's that. Matthias, Matthias is great. Matthias, like, again, he, like, he, from the very beginning, he, you know, put me in touch with everybody I needed to speak with, um, uh, or most of the people I needed to speak with, you know, he facilitated introductions to those 
people. Um, he let me stay at his apartment in, in LA when I was doing research there. Um, he uh, helped me get into Kathy's archive at Duke. Um, and you know, he helped, he flew me to Germany for a Kathy Acker conference in 2018. Um, so he's been, you know, relentlessly helpful and encouraging. And, um, you know, he really wanted to see this book exist too. Like he, you know, he, he is, a, a, you, know, you know, probably more than anybody is, is so invested in Kathy's legacy and, and, and seeing that her, I mean, one of the things he said to me early on is that, you know, he was so worried about her work disappearing. And and knew that the value of a biography to to, to maintain that works yeah. life. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think that too. I that's partly why I love your book so much. Um, there's another here, a quickie. Um, what's it been like to spend so much time thinking about this creature, Kathy? I added the word creature. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> did your, did your opinion change over time? Um, it's funny. I, I say it, it didn't really change. Um, like I, I, when I started the book, I naively thought it would take me a year and a half, two years to write. Um, and I had read a biography, sorry, an interview with Adam Begley. He wrote a, a biography of John Updike uh, a few years ago, and and he talked about in this interview um, that there's two year biographies, there's five year biographies, and there's ten year biographies. And he's, when he was writing his his update one, he was like, I'm not going to do a five-year biography. Like, I'm, two years is enough. That's as long as I want to spend inside John Updike's head and, and, and life and work. <laughs> so when I was doing this, I was like, yeah, I could do this in two years. And then five years passed. And and, and then it became almost 10 years. And, and the, the most exciting thing about writing the book was that I, I never got bored like I was oh. fascinated, fascinated by Kathy and everything I learned about Kathy was fascinating and, and you know maybe it's fascinating to me and three other people but like every single thing I learned every anecdote every interpretation that somebody shared every memory that somebody shared like every you know notebook page like it was just relaying remain fascinating to me and so I was so like I, I can't think of it, very many figures that I could say that of like it was really extraordinary how I never you know it never became a chore like I, I could have been working on it like I, I wish the book was a thousand pages long and I probably would take another 10 years to get there but it is yeah it is that's really a beautiful nice. sentiment if I had to write a biography on John Updike I would I'd stick <laughs> forks in my eyes that's... yeah you wouldn't want it to be a two you'd want to be a two week two day biography yeah yeah <laughs> I'm sorry just telling the truth <laughs> um, do you think um so she was never my teacher. Um, so I don't mean this question as pedantic and literal as it sounds, but do you think she taught you some things? Like if we were oh, yeah. pretending she taught you a few things, what yeah. kind of things would you say? She taught me to be fearless. Like I'm not nearly as fearless as she. I mean, I think her, her like, it's, it's interesting that like she was so, uh, I mean, I say this in the book frequently, but like just so uh, uncompromising in every way and that and you know that as a as an artist that's great um and, and something to strive for um I think uh but extremely difficult to do I mean and, and then to do it also in your life in your personal life I mean that that was really difficult it's difficult to live like that and and yeah I mean, that it, it often was you know caused her a lot of pain um but I think uh, as a creative person to try to like really stick to your this is really sounds banal, but stick to your guns and, and, you know, and, and like really like she just did what she wanted to do as a, as an artist, um, no matter what happened. And, and like, that's something to be admired and, and something I learned, like, you know, I was reminded of constantly. Absolutely. I, I, we don't have a lot of time left, I'm sure, but I, I wondered, you know, she's, she sort of she was sort of a prickly pear because she argued with people all the time, and a woman arguing without letting up isn't isn't an attractive thing to mainstream culture for yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, um, I can list thirty examples of how we can't handle that, but it was so much a part of her personality to like debate or argue or say no, I don't agree with that. Um, I don't I don't know that that's a question but it it's another singularity about her you know true yeah she just kept agitating in that way 
that's true. I was talking to another writer uh, a couple of days ago about who knew Kathy well, and she says, yeah, she just argued and she was so illogical, always so logical. And, and other people said, but I think it was like, it was her, uh, really her resistance to systems and systematic thinking, like she really seemed to not like that and would prefer to err on the other, on the opposite extreme. Can you say, I, I read many different versions of what she looks like to other people. Um, some people, you know, spoke about her, her clown image. Um, other people spoke of eccentrism or, you know, her look to you, just you personally. Um, what, how do you receive the different looks that she inhabited or projected? Um, I mean, some of them, like, it's funny, like, I found her sexy-ish when I first saw her. Totally. You know, I agree with that. Well, I know you agree with that. Yeah. But I, I but I, but she was never like, I, this sounds lame, but like, not my type. Like, I never really found her sexually uh, attractive to me, but, um, but, but she always looked like amazing. Like, she always was like, I mean, even when some of the looks now look kind of dated, like, I mean, at the time, like, she was just kind of just an extraordinary looking person. And, yeah. And, made herself look unlike so many other people like she'd always like from the beginning like from her earliest high school years like she really tried to look different than the people around her um and I think succeeded yeah I was of the mind that uh her look was an expression of her turning herself inside out and that's why nobody else looked like her but I that's know. just <laughs> that's just an idea I carry in my heart but that's how I that's my read on it that's interesting well, anybody else want to get a quickie in? Going once, going <laughs> twice. I see our beloved Kevin has emerged, the Oz of Powell's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I have so many questions and we didn't really get to chat beforehand. But anyway, I'm so looking forward to diving into this book and even just looking, this is the book, by the way, folks. Um, and uh, I'll put a link to that again in our chat so you can buy it from us. Um, yeah, the, the index itself is so long and interesting, just yeah. skimming through the index of all of these people's names. Um, you know, uh, older names from, you know, back in the day, like Rex Roth and stuff like that, to, you know, even people uh, that are still doing great stuff today mentioned throughout the book um it yeah i'm just really blown away by all of the end notes and the index and stuff so my i guess my question is how long did it take you to to put together all the end notes is that just like a whole other <laughs> that took a while project took a while, yeah i mean i'm glad i didn't have to index it like simon and schuster some of simon schuster did that for me but the notes sure yeah they took a long time yeah yeah um i can't even remember how long but many weeks months maybe. Yeah. yeah really amazing stuff um and let's see i'm also gonna tell everyone viewing that they can watch this event again on our youtube channel i put the link to our youtube channel in the chat and this will be uh, showing up there sometime tomorrow, probably. So please uh, feel free to watch that. Share it with friends and family. Um, Lydia's, one of, one of Lydia's many beautiful books, Thrust, again, Eat Your Mind. Also, wonderful photographs in the book, too, which were great. So my, my wife, Liz Sullivan, who was responsible for those. Oh, beautiful. So beautiful. Yeah. Uh, one comment in the chat here, it says, before you leave, is there anything you'd like to leave us with? Uh, me? <laughs> <laughs> please go buy your book at Powell's, please. <laughs> and th thank you very much to Powell's and to Kevin and to Bree and to Lydia. I mean, it was really an honor and I, I wish we were all in person and hopefully we will be uh, someday. But thank you all very, very much. Yeah, that'd be great. When the paperback comes out. Yeah, exactly. Tell, yeah. tell them now. Plan the paperback okay, tour. Okay. And come here. Yeah. All right. Well, Jason, Lydia, great to see you. And a um, uh, wonderful talk. And um, everyone at home, thanks for tuning in. Thank and you. 
Have a great night. Thank you. You too. Bye. 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 Thank you so much, Lydia. <laughs>